Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. This is Dr. Darius, Bio 117, and this is Anatomy Physiology 2 and Chapter 19, and we're going to talk about uh, respiratory. So, start looking at this. There we go. So respiratory, of course, uh, know the functions. And the number one function, of course, is respiration or gas exchange. And that's the most important part. Okay. Exchanging gases. Which gases? Of course, uh, it goes oxygen for energy and carbon dioxide um, um, you know, uh, as a waste byproduct. Um, so oxygen. Carbon dioxide. Um, it's covered in mucosa, uh, the insides of our, our respiratory system, and functions to moisten and warm incoming air uh, for a number of reasons. And we talked about some of them in the lecture. One of them being is that your olfactory and gustatory taste, taste and smell sense um, require an aqueous environment. Um, therefore, uh, the mucus keeps it moist. And it actually, um, your alveoli, uh, um, they also require, it can't be dry, it can't be wet, uh, but it has to be somewhere in the middle of moist. Of course, voice, vocal, sense of uh, smell and taste, we told it. And this is another one, biggie, help regulate blood pH. Okay. Uh, know the difference between your upper and lower respiratory tract. The cutoff is trachea. Trachea on down belongs to the lower respiratory tract. The upper respiratory tract is relatively benign regarding its pathologies, but it's the lower respiratory tract that can potentially give it, uh, give us trouble. So here, everything on from the trachea on down, right, um, requires attention. Um, you have your sinuses up here, nasopharynx, your oral cavity here, oropharynx, and um, your larynx right here, the cartilage right here, laryngopharynx, which is here, esophagus back here, trachea, of course, here, C shaped cartilaginous rings, and here is a piece of cartilage here as your epiglottis. Uh, olfactory receptors, we already know about this, your nasal conche. Or your turbinates. Um, those are the, uh, they're like shelves. That's what they, we were talking about. They're like little shelves uh, um, that are in your nasal cavity. Um, again, everything is covered by mucous membranes through the stratified ciliated epithelium with goblet cells. Sinuses are here, there are several of them. Um, and here's the conche or the, the shelving that holds you know, um, that uh, provide passageway into uh, nasal passageway into your uh, nasal pharynx and into your um, respiratory system. Sinuses, just talked about nasal pharynx, oral pharynx, laryngopharynx. We also know that from a um, previous uh, lecture. Here's something important. Adam's apple, thyroid cartilage, cricoid, and your epiglottis. Those are your three single cartilages in your larynx, which is your voice box. Okay. Now you have uh, true and false vocal cords. The true vocal cords are the ones that vibrate, so uh, you know when you speak or sing. But your false vocal cords here acts kind of like a sphincter. So when the epiglottis goes down, the false vocal cords also contract and uh, squeeze this area so that, um, you know, not only epiglottis, it'll be a nice tight um, uh, seal so that nothing go, no food or water go into the trachea. Here's another view of your epiglottis right here. Now your trachea, C-shaped cartilaginous rings, your thyroid cartilage, also known as your Adam's apple, 
more pronounced in the uh, male. Cricoid cartilage is uh, right here. Your trachea. This is your carina. That is the bifurcation of, you know, where it splits into your right main stem bronchus and your left main stem bronchus. Your right is much shorter and more vertically placed. Therefore, most um, uh, foreign body will fall into the right lung. Your right lung is separated into a superior, middle, and inferior uh, lobe. And your left lung only has a superior and inferior lobe, but it houses the cardiac, which is your heart cardiac notch right here. Of course, the lungs are uh, covered by a serosal membrane. The double membrane is your visceral and parietal. Parietal is on the outside, viscera is on the inside, closest to the lungs, and you have your serosal or pleural cavity in between. Um, you will also notice that um, as the uh, bronchus becomes smaller and smaller into what they call bronchioles, remember ole uh, just means um, much smaller tube, um, all that cartilage gets replaced with smooth muscle. And of course, all of this is controlled by visceral uh, and your autonomic nervous system. You can't, you, you can't control whether you can open or close these. Um, another important feature about this picture is, of course, the sacs of grapes at the very, very end associated with the capillaries. This is the exact location of gas exchange, these capillaries right here, along with your alveoli. Okay. Remember, alveoli, those uh, capillaries, are areas for gas exchange. Very important. You can also see how thin they are. Um, also, the movement of carbon dioxide and oxygen is dictated by pressure gradients. So in order for carbon dioxide to go inside the alveoli, the pressure must be greater out here than inside. And for oxygen uh, to move out of the lungs, the pressure inside the lungs must be greater and uh, the pressure outside lesser. So that's how gas exchange works, works uh, through diffusion. But here, this is osmosis because it's through a semi-permeable membrane. This report, we already talked about that. Here is um, your uh, costal cartilage. That's important because we're going to be talking about how you inspire or how you breathe in. And um, this cartilage has to be a little bit flexible, and there will be muscles in between here. Okay. And of course, uh, not pictured here, there's going to be a big flat muscle here, your diaphragm. Now, why are those muscles important? Forget about atmospheric pressures and boils long, whatever. Know that in order for you to inhale, let's draw inhale, um, I guess, this, this color. So, once the diaphragm, it's going to go down. Right, and, and this is inspiration. Wow, it's taking me forever to write this. Inspiration. So, of course. When the diaphragm goes out and then the intercostal muscles here go up and out, right, when they contract, well, it's going to make a overall negative pressure inside the lung. And since atmospheric pressure here is a positive number, let's put a positive out here, therefore, the gradient will go from positive to negative. So my patient will then do what? Inhale. Now, what happens when you exhale? See, when uh, the plunger starts pushing back in, now there's going to be a positive pressure in here. Let's make that in blue. Right? And if it's positive pressure here, greater than the pressure outside, of course, um, it'll be the exact opposite. Air will then go up. Okay, 
So you can use this plunger analogy on a syringe. Uh, inspiration. Now, uh, inspiration, of course, is active because it requires these two muscles, your diaphragm and your intercostal muscle. Uh, but expiration is passive. Here's another view of how your uh, intercostal muscles, both external and internal muscles, can move your chest up and out. Or out and up. This way. So, kind of like uh, the handle of a bucket. Um, what's next? Oh, this. Um, of course, we don't like this, so we're going to show you the thing we showed. Sec. We showed this picture, didn't we? So when we look at this, this is the lung volumes for spirometry. If my patient's just breathing normally, like so, that's of course their tidal volume, right? Around 500 cc's. From my exam, you don't need to know the volume, just know what they match up to. So just normal inspiration, expiration, quiet breathing, is called tidal volume. If you ask your patient to inhale as much as they can, that's your inspiratory reserve volume or your IRB. If you let them rest a little bit, breathe, 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 and then you let them exhale as much as they possibly can. It's impossible to exhale your entire lung volume. So that's your expiratory reserve. When you inhale, and I mean exhale as much as you possibly can, and of course, what be left go. Your inspiratory capacity is your tidal volume plus your inspiratory reserve volume. Your functional residual capacity is your expiratory volume right here plus your residual volume here. And the vital capacity is your expiratory reserve volume plus tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve volume, also known as your ERV plus TV plus IRV. And of course, the total lung capacity is everybody. Okay. So pause that part of the video is much better than reading this. This is pretty crazy. Crazy as in not mentally ill. We want to use the like crazy as in annoyed. How's that? Remember, we talked about the only place in your lung uh, that there could be gas exchange that was uh, at the level of the alveoli. Everywhere else is considered dead space because it's not contributing to gas exchange. So here are some three terms. Your anatomic dead space, I want you to think of. That's everything except alveoli. Your alveolar dead space. Now that's all the alveoli that are not being are not being used. Okay, so it doesn't mean non-functional alveoli. It doesn't mean that these particular alveoli are broken. It's just that at that moment they're not being used. If they're not being used, then they're considered alveolar dead space. And then you put these two together, anatomic dead space plus alveolar dead space, and what you get? Physiologic dead space. It's everything except your, um, it's, 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 it's everything except your alveoli that you are using. How's that? Non respiratory movements. Coughing, I want you to think uh, clear the lower airway. Breathing. Upper. Laughing, crying, hiccuping, right? And yawning has no established function. And of course, you can't. Um, you can't, uh, if you're not breathing, you're not talking very well. That's symptomatic enough. 
respiratory areas need to know all these medullary area is comprised of the VRG and the DRG. DRG sets the rhythm, right, the basic rhythm, and then DRG modifies that. And that happens all in the medulla oblongata. But you also have your PRG, which also sets rhythm. Uh, pressures. Uh, partial pressure of O2 is PO2, partial pressure of CO2 is PCO2, and then of course H plus, I want you to think um, uh, um, um, acid. But the main controlling factor in our central nervous system is your PCO2, which is related to your pH, which is your hydrogen ion. Mm -hmm. Central chemoreceptors think monitor the brain, pH in the brain, and if they don't look at PO2, they look at CO2. The CO2 crosses the blood-brain barrier. So H plus is the link linked directly to CO2. Now your peripheral chemoceptors, let's make that a different color. Massive changes in the blood PO2. And where do we uh, monitor that? Um, left and right carotid and aortic bodies. Alveoli gas exchange, we already talked about that. We already showed that there's a gradient from a high concentration. Remember, this is um, millimeters of mercury is um, measurement of pressure. And you can see the PO2 has to go in here because this is deoxygenated, not a lot of oxygen. So this place up here in the alveoli has a lot of oxygen, so it goes right into the capillary. Another version of it. Yet another version. So that's the summary for chapter 19. I hope you enjoyed yourself, because I did. Um, I'll see you in class.